but the belief... A mad countess who bathed in human blood. A murderous tyrant who dined among his corpses. Both inspired the greatest monster we've ever known. History records another monster that never really lived, and yet thousands of people were mistaken for it. Judged demons, they ended up victims of one of the worst killing sprees of all time. Adam and Eve and a vampire. According to Hebrew mythology, Lilith was a winged, clawed creature cast out from the Garden of Eden for disobeying Adam. Enraged, she wandered the earth, haunting the dreams of the first mortals. Legend says she feasted on the blood of newborns. Lilith is the first vampire in history but not the last. The Egyptians believed in a ghost-like vampire who also sucked the blood of children. The Babylonians lived in fear of the blood-sucking Ikimu, a restless soul doomed to spend eternity searching for victims. The Greeks were stalked by the demon Lamia, who donned the guise of a beautiful woman to drink the blood of young men. Today, the vampire remains the monster that will not die. In our culture, what keeps the vampire myth alive is the seductive power that the vampire has. He's able to have complete control over his victims. But the really special thing about the vampire is the gift that he gives with his seduction, eternal life. A vampire is, is basically a person who, in the body, comes back from the dead and attacks people and drinks their blood. The blood is seen as the carrier of the life force. And by extension, a vampire is then also someone who saps your life force. The word vampire comes from the Hungarian word vampir, which in turn is rooted in a mythical figure from Slavic folklore called Upir, a spirit who nourished himself by feasting on the living. The Hungarians also had a word for a corpse that wouldn't rest, Nosferatu, the undead. Throughout Eastern Europe during the Dark Ages, the myth of the vampire thrived. The Eastern Orthodox Church didn't put nearly so much pressure on the local population to rid themselves of pre-Christian beliefs. And the Western Church did, the Catholic Church did. So these belief in the vampire has survived much, much better in the East than it has in the West. In the Middle Ages, all of Europe was ravaged time and again by a real monster. We know it as the bubonic plague. Superstitious Europeans knew it only as an unfathomable terror that left a corpse with a discolored face. They called it the Black Death. Those struck by the plague sometimes lapsed into a coma. Presumed dead, they were often buried alive. Stories spread of corpses clawing their way out of freshly dug graves, breathing new life into the myth of the vampire. Unable to explain the Black Death, much less fight it, villagers blamed the undead. The vampire of the past was, in a way, a scapegoat. When things went wrong in a village, they would blame the last person who died, and they would dig that person up. The things that they interpreted as evidence that the body was a vampire were a change in color, and they thought that if the body had turned darker than it had been in life, then it was a vampire. They would dig them up and they would see the blood on their face and they would assume 
that the blood came from drinking from the living when in fact that was just part of the process of, uh, of decay. By the 15th century, the Black Death had wiped out a fourth of Europe's population. Then the killer vanished as mysteriously as it appeared. The vampire might have disappeared with it. Instead, he came alive in one man. A tyrant whose thirst for blood would not be surpassed for 500 years. In the 15th century, the kingdom of Wallachia in what is now Romania was racked by civil war. The king of Wallachia belonged to the Order of the Dragon, a group sworn to fight the Turks in support of the church. He was called Dracul, the word for both dragon and devil. When Dracul was killed in 1447 by his own nobles, the crown passed to his son, Vlad Tepish, called Dracula, literally the son of the devil. No one guessed the boy would live up to his name. Throughout childhood, Vlad had been held hostage by the Sultan of Turkey to keep his father at bay. Released to take the throne, Vlad swore vengeance on his father's killers. He invited them to a great feast, then locked them in the hall and burned it down. He spent the rest of his life wreaking havoc on his enemies, real and imagined. His favorite form of execution was impaling his victims alive on a long, sharpened stake. The stake was then set in the ground, and the victim left to struggle like a worm on a hook in an agonizingly slow death. So many people were executed this way, guilty and innocent, that Vlad acquired the title, The Impaler. He even had a table set among his dying victims so he could dine amid their agony. Vlad Tepish was not a vampire. He was a bloodthirsty uh, ruler who killed a lot of people. He was as bloodthirsty a ruler as anyone up until Hitler. Vlad was merciless with wives who were unfaithful, or in his view, just careless. Seeing a peasant with a frayed shirt, Vlad demanded to meet the man's wife. Vlad at once condemned the poor woman to death. Her husband insisted she was a good wife and begged that her life be spared. In vain. What are you doing? <laughs> With the old wife still writhing on the stake, Vlad assigned the grieving peasant a new wife. With the curt order to pay more attention to her husband's attire than her predecessor. <laughs> As his fame spread, the name Dracula became synonymous with evil. When he died in 1476, his head was cut off and impaled on a stake. Yet Vlad lived on. His murderous life would help inspire the most famous vampire in history. So would the dark deeds of a Hungarian noblewoman with a gift for torture and a thirst for blood. Countess Elizabeth Bathory was born in 1560 to a noble Hungarian family with a history of madness. At 15, she was married to a young nobleman, Forenz Nasadi. When he went off to war, Elizabeth was left with an empty castle and time on her hands. She soon found a way to fill both. Under cover of darkness, the mad countess and her servants would kidnap peasant girls and whisk them into her dungeon. Once inside, none escaped to tell what happened. Elizabeth was a self-taught sadist, and she learned fast. When her husband returned home, he tolerated her experiments until 1604 when, suddenly and mysteriously, he too died. During one session, Elizabeth was splashed by a victim's blood. 
she became convinced it made her flesh younger. The Countess soon indulged a new obsession, bathing in the blood of young girls. She had found the key to eternal life, but eternal life required more bodies. The tortures went on. From bathing, it was only one step to drinking. Elizabeth would pierce the flesh of a victim, hoist her up to the rafters, then swallow the blood as it ran down. Elizabeth buried her victims on the grounds of the castle till she ran out of room. Then her servants simply dumped the bodies in the forest. When the villagers began discovering corpses drained of blood, they blamed the deaths on vampires. Bodies continued to appear for several decades until 1610, when the truth reached Elizabeth's cousin, Count Ferzo. He was astounded to learn 650 girls had vanished and were presumed dead. His justice was swift. He executed the servants and sealed Elizabeth in her room. Four years later, the blood countess Elizabeth Bathory died. But the myth of the vampire lived on. Could you survive a night in a hot revenants? Beings who returned from the grave. Then, in 1706, Charles Ferdinand de Schertz wrote the Magia Pashuma, a legal approach to hunting vampires. He included an account of a particularly strong vampire from Bohemia that was stabbed through the heart and burned by the town executioner before it was vanquished. The living protected themselves by wearing silver, long considered magical, simply because it was rare. Others wore a cross. Garlic, reputed to be a cure-all, was also prized as a vampire repellent. But its real value lay in masking the odor of decaying flesh as vampire hunters dug up a corpse. In the second quarter of the 19th century, there was a guy who was making little um, vampire kits for coping with vampires if you traveled into Eastern Europe. And he had a pistol that you could load with silver balls, and he had garlic in this kit, and he had a combination steak and sword, which I thought was very, uh, very nice. The first great blow against vampires was struck by a book. In 1746, Dom Augustin Calme, a French Benedictine monk and biblical scholar, published his best-selling Treatise on Vampires and Revenants. While believing in vampires, Calme challenged the myths surrounding them, including the notion that a corpse could escape through five feet of earth. One of the few voices of reason belonged to a woman, Maria Theresa, Empress of Austria. In 1755, she heard reports from Moravia of widespread grave desecration. The cause? A vampire scare, founded on corpses that hadn't decomposed. She sent her personal doctor to investigate. He discovered the corpses had not decomposed simply because the earth was dry and the weather cold. Maria Theresa banned vampire hunting and ordered reports of vampirism be made to the government, not to the church. Peasants ignored the edict, more fearful of the undead than the police. Just as logic was gaining on the vampire, fiction came to his rescue. In 1819, John Polidori wrote The Vampire, a gothic novel about a handsome, jaded nobleman who savaged his victims in his thirst for blood. But it was a frustrated writer named Bram Stoker who in 1897 created the vampire that's died a thousand deaths and still comes back. 
Reaching back 500 years to the devil incarnate, Vlad the Impaler, Stoker invented the greatest monster in history, Dracula. Stoker had a genius for innovation. Other writers had endowed the vampire with the power to take the form of an animal, but Stoker hit upon the perfect beast, the vampire bat. A creature that also hunts by night and lives on blood. He also made the vampire a sex symbol. The ancient vampire had little to do with sexuality. When Bram Stoker talked about drinking from the neck, that that erotic act was really just a substitute for sexual intercourse, which was not permitted to be written about in those days. In its pristine form, as in Dracula, the vampire is, is a way of, of talking about rape without ever mentioning it. The vampire attacks and defiles. As the years go by, it carries an increasingly larger sexual component. So that the old stories of vampirism were very disgusting, very non-sexual. But as the vampire evolved, he became more handsome, more sophisticated, more powerful, more popular, and the sexual component, the romantic component, became larger and larger. With the dawn of the 20th century, the vampire was safely imprisoned on the silver screen, where he could do nothing more than give us a nervous night's sleep. Or so we thought. In 1924, Germany was shocked by the crimes of Fritz Harman, a butcher shop owner who enticed young boys to his home where he would kill them with one vicious bite to the neck. Harman not only drank the blood of several of his 27 victims, he sometimes ate their flesh. He ground up the bodies of others for sausage and sold it to his customers. In 1949, England executed George High for killing nine people, drinking their blood, then dissolving their bodies in acid. Newspapers dubbed him the Acid Bath Vampire. The vampire, a creature born entirely of myth, still inspires some of the most ghastly crimes. A teenage vampire cult that moves from drinking each other's blood to cold-blooded murder rapist who bites his victims and drinks their blood. Five centuries ago, all such criminals, the butcher shop Dracula and the acid bath vampire, would have been viewed as real vampires. Yet all were true monsters. From the time that we're little kids, we're taught what monsters are. Monsters are ugly, evil, completely bad people that grab you, take you away, and maybe gobble you up. Now, if you think about what monsters do, real ones, monsters do things for sex. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Now I believe I was sick. In 1992, Jeffrey Dahmer was convicted of killing 17 men and boys. He dismembered their bodies, drank their blood, and ate their flesh. Sentenced to life in prison, he was found too monstrous even by other inmates. In 1994, they bludgeoned him to death. Dracula is still on the loose, but in a watered-down version. Harmless, at least to others. Modern, self-proclaimed vampires who drink human blood. I am not a Satanist. I have nothing to do with devil worship. I don't attack and kill people. The people that I take blood from are donors, not victims. These are willing um, people, consenting adults, never an animal, never a child. 
I think vampires speak to some very deep levels of our own feelings and consciousness. Uh, that's why they have caught on in ways that other monsters have not. I mean, Frankenstein, the werewolf, the mummy are all very popular, but you don't have fan clubs uh, for them. You do have fan clubs for the vampire, for Count Dracula, and for Lestat. The would-be vampire with a quiet taste for human blood inhabits a tiny world, a cult within a cult. He lives not simply on the fringe of society, but beyond it. But then, so did the vampire. The vampire represents someone who is outside of society, who in a way is powerless because of his own needs to survive. And so um, it gives people something to identify with. Someone say, oh, he's just like me. The vampire is the strangest of creatures, a being who never really lived, and yet who exists throughout time. He has died a thousand deaths, but returns again and again in the guise of a mass murderer and a serial killer. He is a figure of myth and fact. If vampires are simply living monsters, then they still walk among us. Coming up, history records another monster that never really lived, and yet thousands of people were mistaken for it. Judged demons, they ended up victims of one of the worst killing sprees of all time. never really lived, and yet thousands of people were mistaken for it. Judged demons, they ended up victims of one of the worst killing sprees of all time. In 1628, Johannes Junius of Bomberg, Germany, was accused of one of the most foul deeds of his day, witchcraft. He was interrogated by his own brother-in-law. Junius protested he was innocent, but two other alleged witches were brought in who claimed they saw Junius at a witch's gathering. Junius was found guilty, but his interrogation continued. His hands were tied behind his back. Then he was hoisted to the ceiling and dropped until his shoulders were dislocated. The torture was repeated seven more times. Awaiting execution, Junius managed to write a letter to his daughter and bribe a guard to deliver it. The letter still survives. It's a rare account of common cruelty. Innocent have I come into prison. Innocent have I been tortured. Innocent must I die. For whoever comes into the witch prison must be tortured until he invents something out of his head. The executioner put thumb screws in me, both hands bound together so that the blood ran out of the nails and everywhere, so that for four weeks I could not use my hands, as you can see from the writing. During his torture, Junius was forced to confess to attending gatherings of witches and to poisoning animals. Then he had to accuse innocent men of the same crimes. Dear child, keep this letter secret, else I shall be tortured most piteously and the jailers will be beheaded. Good night for your father, Johannes Junius. We'll never see you again. Johannes Junius was beheaded by sword, his remains cremated in the Bomberg witch oven. He was just one victim of a frenzy that swept Europe for three centuries, leapt the ocean to America, and claimed a hundred thousand lives. All were executed for a crime they never committed, witchcraft. Christian witch hunters were spurred on by the highest of authorities, the Bible. Exodus 22, chapter 18 reads, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. But the fear of witches is as old as time. 
there was this belief that certain people had certain special powers. The Greeks and the Romans, they would call them pythonesses, women who could foretell the future. The Hebrews had uh, people that they called diviners or seers uh, that they forbade people to go see. By the Middle Ages, the backbone of Europe was the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope's influence was stronger than any king's. The Church's power rested on the loyalty of its followers, but their loyalty was suspect. Although converts to Christianity, many still practiced pagan rituals. What was really going on was the church was threatened by the pagans because the pagans had a much better media package than the church did. The pagans were having all the fun, the church was making all the rules. And so the pagans posed a very big threat to that orthodox, constrained lifestyle. And because they were fighting a losing battle, the only thing they could really do is define the pagans as very evil, very uh, undesirable people, and see if they could do everything they could to drive them out of the land. Originally, uh, witchcraft was the practice of sorcery, simple magic, uh, curing or hurting uh, by the use of a simple spell or a simple remedy, herbs or incantations. In the Middle Ages, witchcraft became something different. It was linked by medieval theologians to worship of Satan. Augustine, an early Christian theologian, argued that pagan religion and pagan magic were invented by the devil to lure mankind away from Christ. In its war for the hearts and minds of its followers, the church turned folk medicine into devil worship. Since many folk healers were women, their presumed power to cure sickness now exposed them to attack. What changed in Christian Europe was that these powers became associated more closely with women and that later they came to be seen primarily as connected with the devil. Women aren't just women, they have this capacity to be the devil in the shape of a woman. So adultery was commonly thought to be a woman's fault, a woman who had bewitched a man. So you're not just sleeping with a woman, you're sleeping with the devil. of the witch began to take shape. Folklore had it that witches would gather in the forest for meetings called sabbats. Here they would fly through the air, mock the church, and pledge their loyalty to Satan. They were said to fornicate with each other, with animals, and with the devil himself. Witches were thought to surround themselves with evil. Demons, in the form of a common pet or farm animal, were a witch's familiar. The familiar spirit uh, seems to have developed in England, where they thought that the witches were assigned a demon by the devil, and that this demon would probably live in a normal household animal, cleverly disguised, like a cat, like a dog, perhaps a mouse, perhaps a rabbit, uh, perhaps a goat. Most of a witch's time, it was said, was spent brewing potions. Now the innocent act of using herbs for healing turned sinister. Most people thought that if you could cure someone, you could also kill them. That if you could make perfumes, you could probably also make a love potion, and perhaps even make poisons. The very word witch is rooted in the ancient word Wicca. The origin of that word Wicca is sometimes associated with wisdom. In other times, it is associated with um, meaning to bend. Wicca coming from the idea that one is a bender or shaper um, through magical practices. One would be able to bend or shape reality. In this superstitious age, a little learning could be a dangerous thing. A woman who knew how to heal naturally was feared by her neighbors as something supernatural. A bad harvest, a disastrous storm, an epidemic of plague, anything whose true cause was unknown could be blamed on a witch. 
still, it took time for fear to conquer reason. As late as 1460, a trio of French prelates announced that witches' sabbats simply didn't happen. They were among the last voices of wisdom heard for three centuries. Within decades, such talk would be branded heresy. Just as Columbus was contemplating a voyage into the unknown waters of the Atlantic, a cloud of ignorance was descending on Europe. After 1484, the church took the official position that witches were harmful and that witches were in league with the devil. And this was part of a mass conspiracy to overthrow the Christian world. It was official. Witchcraft was satanic, the ultimate evil. Kings and commoners now fell into line with the proclamations of the Pope. In its holy war against witchcraft, all the church lacked was a weapon for unmasking witches and destroying them. That weapon was about to arrive. In the late 15th century, two German witch hunters, Jacob Sprenger and Heinrich Instatori, wrote to Pope Innocent VIII an alarming letter. The witch hunters had uncovered tolerance for witchcraft within the church itself. Outraged, the Pope encouraged them in writing an exhaustive handbook for persecuting witches. The Malleus Maleficarum, or Hammer Against the Witches, was first printed in 1486 and distributed in half a dozen languages across Europe. It outlined the four essential ingredients of witchcraft. Renouncing the Christian faith. Devoting body and soul to the service of the devil. Offering up unbaptized children to the devil. And engaging in orgies that included intercourse with the devil. It was a book which um, had more printings than any other book with the exception of the Bible itself in the early 16th century. And it was a book that uh, pointed out that witches were everywhere, they were in the service of Satan, and that it was women who were primarily involved in witchcraft. The reason? According to the book, women were more vulnerable, fickle, carnal, more stupid than men. The Malleus Maleficarum's influence survives to this day. The concept that we have of witches today, of the old ugly woman stirring a cauldron and cackling and riding a broomstick, probably dates from the mid-1500s. Witches are ugly because, of course, ugliness goes with evil. Witches stir cauldrons because a cauldron was a normal cooking pot in the Middle Ages. Broomsticks, a broomstick is something that every woman in the Middle Ages would have had. It was, again, a common tool associated with women that then became associated with a sort of evil magic. The Malleus Maleficarum, including how to torture and execute a witch, but most important, how to reveal one. An early test was called swimming the witch. It involved binding the suspect's wrists and throwing her into deep water. If she sank, it was proof that God's water had accepted her. If she floated, the water was rejecting her, and she was a witch. Either way, the verdict could be fatal. Many of the innocent never survived the trial. Another test was even more lopsided. The suspect was placed on one side of the scales and the Bible on the other. If she weighed more than the holy book, she was a witch. Proven guilty, the witch was executed by hanging or beheading. Then the corpse was burned at the stake, just to be safe. Justice was swift, but not merciful. Once a woman was accused of witchcraft, uh, she was tortured until she admitted that she was a witch. And then she was tortured some more until she admitted anything that the inquisitors asked, which included things like having sex with the devil and 
uh, seeing all of her neighbors at meetings, but there was a lot of pressure put on the women who were accused to name names, to accuse other people. Uh, many of them tried to retract it once the torture had stopped, but they weren't allowed to retract it. Armed with their zeal and their book, witch hunters scoured Europe for the next two centuries, spreading fear and doom. Witch! Accusers sometimes had private reasons for pointing a finger. Burn the witch! Professional witch hunters went from town to town, offering to rid it of witches for a generous fee. Money, not religion, often lay at the root of witch hunting. Accused witches, or their families, had to pay for their own imprisonment. If suspects had no family, their property could be confiscated to pay their bills. The trial itself offered an opportunity for something besides justice. A popular test for unmasking a witch involves stripping the suspect naked to look for marks of the devil. The courtroom became a forum for voyeurism, 16th century style. A lot of the witch trials and a lot of the torture and examination and cross-examination of the witches had a very strong sexual component. And because sexuality was so suppressed within the church community and the community as a whole, a lot of these people got their sexual pleasure and their sexual energy out of torturing and examining and uh, pressuring and questioning these people that said they were witches. Since a mole or birthmark was proof enough, the examiners were rarely disappointed. Midwives, once common in Europe, became another victim of witch hunters and of doctors guarding their turf. The midwives were persecuted along with the witches because there was a rising medical establishment who really wanted to get rid of them. Anybody who was a uh, dissenter, a heretic, a Jew, a Muslim, a um, witch, as they defined them, uh, those people would be demonized and considered to be working for Satan. Witches fared no better at the hands of the other great heretics of the time, Protestants. When Martin Luther and John Calvin broke from the church in the 16th century, they made sure they were as fanatical as the Catholics in persecuting witches. Said Luther, I should have no compassion for these witches. I should burn all of them. Johannes Unius, the man who left a heart-wrenching letter for his daughter before being put to death as a witch, was executed by the Prince Bishop of Bomberg, Johann Gregor II. During his 10-year reign, Gregor killed more than 600 people in a hall built specifically to jail and torture witches. It was filled with racks, thumbscrews, skull crushers, and leg vices. The atrocities committed within its walls were done in the name of God, but what reigned was unholy terror. If suspects managed to survive the hall, what awaited them outside was even more hellish. Witch hunters considered fire a purifying element, and Gregor followed the usual custom of burning witches at the stake. Yet he added his own gruesome touch. Rather than beheading his victims first, he set them ablaze while they were still alive. In 1669, Hysterical children in the Swedish town of Mora swore they had been seized by neighbors and flown to a witch's sabbat. Eighty-five old women were burned at the stake. In both the 16th and 17th century witch crazes and the modern sex abuse uh, crazes that we're experiencing, uh, children often make the accusations. And the feeling is, is we should always believe the children. They wouldn't lie and they wouldn't make stuff up. The truth is, they do both as every child psychologist knows. Children were behind the greatest witch scare in America. It happened in the Massachusetts Bay Colony where the Puritans settled. They brought with them their fear of witches. As early as 1647, one decade after the Puritans landed, 
Witches were tried in Hartford, Connecticut. But the bloodiest witch hunt took place in a small New England village where the devil held court. In 1692, girls in Salem began accusing neighbors of witchcraft. Town leaders investigated. A childish game turned into a witch hunt that trapped hundreds of victims. The Malleus Maleficarum, the centuries-old guide to witch hunting, failed to cover a legal twist introduced at Salem. Spectral evidence. That is testimony based on dreams, fantasies, and hallucinations. Caught up in the hysteria, judges ruled it was admissible. In a kind of wicked catch-22, spectral evidence was proved simply because it could not be disproved. If a witness did run into trouble, she could always fall back on hysterics. She would collapse to the floor, screaming as if tormented. Her arms and legs jerked convulsively. She foamed at the mouth. They do bad things against their will. Ironically, if the accused confessed to being a witch, her life was spared. The Puritans would not execute those who admitted their sins. Those who maintained their innocence often did so to their last breath. In all, more than 200 people were accused during the Salem witch trials. 19 were convicted and executed. No one, rich or poor, was immune from this brand of justice. You are a witch! One of the differences that we see in America, uh, sort of the, the dubious um, side of our more egalitarian culture, is that women of all classes are accused of witchcraft, and much more so than in Europe. And wealthier women end up being executed for witchcraft. They believed in witches. They saw witches. They accused witches, they persecuted them, they tried them, they tortured them, and they killed them, all in the belief that this was the right thing to do, it was the Christian thing to do. We're saving their souls. You know how sometimes you get a little... Almost a century later, in 1782, when a Swiss woman was accused of placing a hex on a child and beheaded. It was the last gasp of fear. By the mid-18th century, science could explain phenomena once blamed on witchcraft. Witchcraft itself still survives, although in a harmless form. Witchcraft today is quite different from that Western European Christian conception of witchcraft as um, satanic. There are, of course, some satanic cults today, but the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of people calling themselves witches today have nothing to do with Satan. So many people coming into it, uh, so many people, male and female, saying that they feel like they're coming home when they come to this religion, that something seemed wrong or out of whack or out of balance for them until they found this. Because what it does is it integrates reverence for the earth that people naturally feel. If witchcraft is alive and well, so is witch hunting. But now it takes a different form. Hysterical contagion is the phenomenon of an idea or an experience running rampant through a community. And throughout history, we've had many, many, many cases of that. One of the more recent ones was the Pepsi scare, where somebody said that they found a syringe in a Pepsi can. And within weeks, we had several hundred cases phoned in of people finding things in Pepsi cans, when in actuality, nothing was ever found. Once you've defined a group as not you, and not belonging to your group, and devalued them and made them inhuman, it's not a big leap then to be able to destroy them, kill them, and eliminate them because they're not human. 
once accused of witchcraft were often guilty of a crime far more common and more sinister. The crime of being different. Such criminals are found in all cultures through all time. Sheer terror once put to death a hundred thousand people. But it was the witch hunters themselves who were bewitched, not by hexes or potions, but by the spell of fear. Coming up next, 16th century South America is about to receive some unwelcome visitors. Are they bold adventurers or brutal killers? Settle